and that this is our opportunity to do it this time within a human body. And I will say that through meditation today, that one of the most important messages that I was receiving from the guardians was, can you truly see your body as the special vehicle that it really is? That it's just the body that you're in this incarnation, this time. But there's not a single other body out there that's any better, that's more special, that yes, there are some that have different gifts and capabilities, but your consciousness is in this one. And you have just as much an ability to awaken your consciousness fully within this vehicle and utilize all of its gifts that all of us here haven't even tapped into yet. And that's the amazing thing is a lot of times we feel trapped in a body that it's like we're in the dark and we haven't even read the owner's manual yet. So we don't even, we're many times you find humanity complaining about their body, but we're complaining about something that we haven't even figured out all of its gifts, all of its capabilities and how absolutely divinely special this is. This is not something that accidentally came about. This is something that was very intended, very well thought out, very much a very special thing for us to be a part of. So within this, that we're going to look at it from the perspective of Akhenaten. That Akhenaten uh, was one of the rulers of Egypt around 1300 BC. Now I'm not a great historian, so I'm going to be sharing some information from this timeline, but primarily I'm going to be inviting you to go into this a little bit deeper. I'm actually gonna be posting with this video Another video that I, I really appreciated someone's presentation on Akhenaten specifically. And with that, that it's going to be your gift to kind of go into it a little bit further if you have incarnational memories around this timeline. This is going to be Egyptian timeline memories. This is going to be memories of even potentially fighting for the Christ consciousness, for the for the teachings of the law of one and of unity and really rebelling against the priests, the, the, um, what we're going to find out or the priest, uh, that were really utilizing their positions of power in order to become wealthy, in order to be rulers, in order to be in a state of empowerment over the people. And Akhenaten is going to show us an incredible example of a Syrian star being that came into incarnation in order to really reinstate again, the law of one teachings. So as we see here within this, that this is actually uh, one of the symbols within uh, Egypt of Akhenaten. But what I want to point out within here is that when you look at it, it looks very much like the Sphinx in a lot of ways. The two main symbologies on here I want to point out is one, the sun. So within this, there's going to be a huge connection to the Ra Confederacy, the family of Ra, if you will. And as we look at the family of Ra, that this is a solar family, solar Rishi family lineage line that has come to be a part of this Christ consciousness mission. They came in specifically to help us rebalance creation and in order to help us reinstate balance within the cosmos this balance between the darkness of, and the light. And that within this, that within the symbology of the sun, that it's not so much about the worship of the sun, even though you can see this and, and think that, oh yeah, they worship the sun, they worship uh, this solar disk within the sky, but that is not what it truly represented. But Akhenaten utilized the sun as an example for the people that it was the best example to show the rays of love and wisdom. And that within that, through every ray of sunlight that touched us, that we all had equally the right to receive the rays of light, the rays of love and wisdom within our heart. And that the solar disk was actually a representation of the divine creator, which existed within each and every one of us. 
that again, he had really a statement of the light that exists within me is also the same light that exists within you. Therefore, we are one. The next symbology I really want to show on here is this lion-like being. The lion in Egyptian times symbolized the Sirius star nation. The Sphinx was a symbol of a connection to the Leonite family line and a connection to the Sirius star nation. It was a very much a symbol that stated your intentions of who you were in alignment with. And these Leonite beings were in alignment with the Christos mission. So when you held that kind of symbology, you were telling the world, you were showing the world through symbology, who was also in union with you. And that you were here to fight the Christos mission, so to speak. So as we kind of get to hold this energy, we get to now start to kind of feel this power of it. But I'm going to step back a little bit because we want to talk about what is the office of Christ? What is the blue lodge? What is the great blue lodge? What is the seal of Palador? And the living Ankh in Mayat. So as we get to look at this, that the, the Great Blue Lodge, I have a couple quotes here. So I'm actually going to share some quotes from the book First Contact by Sheldon Niddle. And this one is, it's just a, it's a great read. I, I like to be able to share this with others as a way for you to just feel what resonates for you with it there. But within this quote is the great blue lodge of creation is an order of heaven decreed by Lord Surya. So he has a name for this, for this uh, gestalt or deity. But we're just going to say that it's a, it's a creation of the order of heaven entrusted to act as supreme guides of light in all of physical creation. That this is a very holy place that is presided over by the council of lot of nine and headquartered in this galaxy on Sirius B. So I want, I'm going to show probably about three or four different resources that really continuously point, whether you're looking at the Cathara materials, whether you're looking through the energetic synthesis materials, through his materials, there are various others that also will touch upon the Blue Lodge, the Blue Flame, and the Melchizedek Order. And these are all lineage lines that I want to show the synchronicity. They all lead back to Sirius, and generally Sirius B. Now, Sirius B is one of the primary places that is in unison with Andromeda, with the Pleiades, and with Centaurus that each of these places has planetary systems on them that have duplicated the Blue Lodge uh, temples. And these temples are aquatic. These temples are temples that exonerate and uphold the highest Christic teachings. And these temples are primarily uh, upheld by beings that we would see as aquatic or amphibian. And when we even look at the Lyran Syrians, and the Blue Lodge is also going to symbolize the Maharaji Blue Human lineage line that we see as the blue beings many times that are very common to us now. Are, these are going to be from that same lineage, but when you see these beings, I want to just point out, when you look at Arcturians, when you look at the 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 Lyran Syrians or the Pleiadian Syrians, when you look at these different race lines, even many of the Andromedans, and you see them, they have not only this blue hue to them many times, but also they are, they don't have hair. They're actually, if I want to just invite you to start to even be able to perceive their connection to the aquatic family lineage line. They are a humanoid form of the aquatic lineage lines. And so they are the representation of the progression of creating the genetics of an aquatic race line into being able to walk upon the earth, bipedal. Bipedal is the common form. The, the, and I'm gonna just kind of just show us two arms, two legs, a head, 
And then within that, for the most part, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, two ears, this kind of thing is a base, uh, a base geometry. This is coming from a base geometry within creation. And that regardless of many of the different forms that we look at, whether it's the Christic lineage line of mantis or reptilian or um, leonite, feline, aquatic, when we look at it now within the bipedal form, they're going to have what we just call the humanoid form. So I'm just, what I want to do is I want to bring you guys to where you start to kind of feel this connection to the aquatic realm, because the aquatic realm truly is a lot of the lineage lines that have stayed closer to spirit, to water, because water is the closest form in the material realm to still feeling that essence of spirit and not such physical density. And that within this, it's very much like the fi fabrics of creation when the sound tones, healing through music, healing through sound, healing through frequencies, healing through intentions, because at that level, your intentions are just as strong as if you were reverberating an actual tone into the air. And all of these are creating ripples. And there is an understanding at these levels of healing through these frequencies. So this is really a huge, 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 huge kind of understanding for us to start to really tap into what are these med beds and all of these healing technologies, crystalline technologies, sound and uh, sound and light and color and tones, all of these really originate from these blue flame or blue lodge lineage lines. And the Syrian lodge is one of the primary places that has been utilizing and sharing this wisdom with us. So let's look at what is the Council of Nine. The Council of Nine, we hear it a lot, and this is a higher council, the guardians of the great blue lodge, of the great blue light, of the sacred creation. Um, so one of the chief councils uh, in this galaxy are this Council of Nine. And in this galaxy, the again, the Sirius, um, the blue lodge is housed in the Sirius star nation but the guardians of the blue lodge of the great blue light of sa sacred creation that is what the council of nine is they are the guardians of the blue lodge of the great blue light of sacred creation so i'm going to say that one more time the great blue light of sacred creations just one more time just for fun because we've talked about this a lot and i want to tie in how how we start to piece a lot of puzzles, how you can start reading for all kinds of different texts and all kinds of different resources. But you, if you start to catch the little seeds in them, you go, oh, okay. So even within this, these are the beings, the guardians of the great blue lodge, which are of the great blue light of sacred creation. I'm just gonna fast forward to this just for now. So we have talked over and over again about the Trinity wave, the original gestalts of creation, the solar rishis, the tri-founder flame, the original sound tone frequencies are the gold ray, the blue ray, the great blue light, the blue ray. It is the blue ray, the blue flame, the blue lodge coming from the Maharaji. This is going to be, again, really a representation and a step down when we look at just from the tri-founder flames. These are the eternal cosmic solar Christ consciousness gestalts or creator gods from the God worlds that descend into the lower matrices. So they descend into this universe through the central point of union. So they enter in through the zero point field again, what we might even call the great attractor or through these seed places, through these stargates and doorways into creation. And they make up the Godhead Trinity principle of creation. So this gold ray, blue ray, and violet ray, and many times as it starts to step down to frequency, at the higher frequencies again, these are things called like rayons and, and other terms. But as we bring it down into our third, our third dimensional communication, this is 
the proton, the neutron, the electron, the trinity wave. They are the ensouling principle embodiments that organize into planets, into stars, into celestial objects and ley lines, the dragon lines, and are the eternal source feedback loop, which ends spirits into consciousness units. So this is really when we talk about the Sophia dragon's breath, the spirit breathing through us, and we see those rainbow crystalline breaths of spirit breathing through us, we are truly breathing this original cosmic solar Christ consciousness through us as a living expression. And it, that is how it goes from such a high dimensional vibration all the way down in dimension into our density to have an experience here. So I want to bring that back as just kind of an understanding that when we're talking about the blue lodge, we're really talking about the blue ray, the original blue flame that came through as part of the God world of the Rishis. And as we look at this, that there are stations of governance within our 15 dimensional time matrix. And so the council of not nine in a lot of ways was overseeing the great blue lodge of creation because we just to tie in, we've talked quite a bit about how the Elohim appointed the Syrians to be in, in a station of guardianship and entrusted in order to embody the Christ consciousness mission throughout the lower dimensions. So they are the ones that are the primary missionaries, if you will, that uphold the wisdom teachings and bring them into incarnational cycles. So they bring them in to the earth sphere, they incarnate in, in order to teach wisdom to us. So those of you that hold Sirius star seed lineage, when you feel yourself impulsed to be a teacher, to be a guide, to share wisdom, because it just feels like something you're here to do, <laughs> as you hear me do a lot. <laughs> This is the serious star DNA within you that really impulses you to be that catalyst of change and to share the awakening of hearts with others. So just to feel that at such a deep level that I want to read. So um, I will do my best to, to, so the, all of this quotes here was from Sheldon Nittle in, in for the book, First Contact which is a, and it's a fun, it's a, I like it as a read. Now within this, um, there's another quote within there that he has that when the sixth creation was formed some 50 billion years ago, the creator brought forth the Lords of light in vast multitudes. And these mighty beings of light are familiar to you through the accomplishments of Lord Michael, Lord Mary, Lord Uriel, Ariel, and Lord Gabriel. These beings of light oversee creations, numerous dimensions, and assist in unfolding the potential of the divine plan. So I thought that was a really neat way in which he really stated it more from a galactic or a cosmic kind of understanding and not so much from some mystical or biblical perspective where we just hear, and then God created the angels. <laughs> this is just a way for us to have that experience of seeing how the different levels of creation, each one is created to take care of the next level of creation. And in that, this is something special for us to understand. No stations are any more important. So our station here as an angel angelic human being is not any less important than that of an archangel than that of an Elohim, than that of any of these higher gestalts or stations of being, because we are just a different expression of creation in physical form. And when we awaken our consciousness, we can awaken ourselves to stand into that level of beingness that we realize that even in this little itty bitty teeny human body, we have all of the power and the force of the divine that literally can channel through us. And again, that statement that sure, yes, we can exert our free will here, but truly when we align with the divine will and we allow the divine self, that whole declaration of intention, I surrender my ego now to be in service to my higher self to the law of one mission, 
right? Now we are allowing our vehicle to be a pure vehicle of the expression of the divine creator to awaken Christ consciousness right here, right now, right here on planet earth in this very now moment. And I think that is absolutely amazing. They're saying that within this, um, uh, that the council of nine of the blue lodge of creation in the holy realm of A E O N. So Aeon, the throne of the creator um, oversees this divine council. So this, I actually wanted to put this in here because I want to touch on the power of fire letters, light language, and the angelic, uh, the angelic language, the Elohim letters, the fire letters. Because when we actually start to see the letters, we're going to see that we all kind of resonate with different family lines. And these family lines are going to break down to base structures of, say, L or Ra or On. <laughs> um, they're going to break down to levels of uh, letters. And that from these letters, our DNA, that is our sacred geometry. That is the original blueprint, if you will. Uh, we keep saying, I want to align myself to my original blueprint. Well, a lot of times our, our original blueprint is our original fire letters. W the word of God is right inside of us. Is a, a, the, the Bible and the biblical or, or different teachings kind of took it one way, but it's literally telling us that when you look at our DNA, it's imprinted through language, through the letters. And these letters are imprinted through the solar rishis of which we emanated. So I'm going to tie this into why astrology is one of the sacred sciences, astrology, astronomy, knowing your star map and knowing where you're from, because you can't go through a certain star if you don't have that star's language. But if you birth onto the star and incarnate onto the star, now you grab its language and you hold its genetic patternings and codes within you. You Going through, say, being a Syrian star seed means that you're going to hold the Syrian imprint and language based on the rotational sphere and frequency of that star. And if you, as a human body, tried to go live on Sirius right now, you would pass out. I'm going to tell you that right now. You could not. We're sitting here talking about how we feel dizzy just walking around on earth sometimes right now, or even just kind of like, Ooh, the earth feels like it's moving mainly because we're feeling the dimensional vibrations and frequencies fluctuate as the solar codes are increasing here. So our, our consciousness is having the opportunity to elevate, but if we were to stand next to a high dimensional being more than likely we would black out. More than likely, our body would not be able to hand, handle or withstand that level of frequency, and we would literally black out or become dizzy. So therefore, this is what it means by, by acclimating yourself to your star. So we're, we are acclimated in the human body more to our solar logos in the solar system. In order to acclimate yourself to a higher dimensional frequency, say, like the Sirius star system, it would take a tremendous amount of really purifying the body through a lot of these Syrian initiations. So um, the Council of Nine, um, it, he's actually confirming, um, even within his, his uh, book, in his writings, the Council of Nine being an Orion. Um, and I thought that was amazing. It's just a, a tie-in and how important the belt of Orion, especially Mentaka, um, but the belt of Orion is where the main council sit who have been protecting the heart of the universe, the, and the Orion nebula. So on behalf of humanity, the founders of the guardian Alliance, the Maharaji blue humans of Sirius B, the Syrian council, the Lyran high council, and the many billions of Emerald covenant races of our 15 dimensional time matrix have been really incarnating into earth and to supporting the earth project. That is from the Kilantic uh, sciences. 
And I wanted to show the special map of creation because within even our soul circle, we've talked a little bit about seeing squid like beings or um, beings that have almost like these tentacles. And when I saw this image, it just really reminded me of this, but this is a representation of the special vortex intertwining or braiding within other vortices. So this was a representation within uh, the, it's called Your First Contact. I apologize if I said it wrong, um, by Sheldon Nettle. Um, it's called Your First Contact. And within this, this is called the map of creation. And it shows the central point of creation there as a zero point field in the middle. And that each of those that spirals out would be like, a universe spiraling out from these fractals within the zero point field. And that there are immeasurable numbers of vortices coming from the singularity. And some vortices have more dimensions than others. And our job, imagine these as they spiral, that if you, we've talked about how if you maintain your sacred geometry and your fractalization, that as the fractal continues, that if you keep it in integrity with its original base patterns, that you in truth would be able to go back up, that you would have a clean way of going down and going back up. But when distortions come, it's as if it comes and skews part of these, these vortices, if you will, and therefore either it will die. Think about the root of a tree and they wanna expand and move out. And if that root of that tree starts to, to either be stopped, impeded, cut, not receive the water anymore or any number of things, that root will begin to die. And of course the tree continues on generally from the other roots, but our universe would be like just one of these root strands, right? So we are here to protect that so that eventually in a lot of ways, I like to think of us more of as a banyan tree, that eventually a root can become their own tree to then create more offshoots of roots potentially in the future. Um, very interesting uh, within this. So now I want to start to talk into a little bit of this Maharaji lineage line. So as we kind of look at the Blue Lodge, we're really seeing this as beings appointed by the Lyrans, the Elohim, and the higher gestalts of consciousness in order to be overseers of creation. We are that creation. So it says here, with the assistance of the Syrian council, the Elohim, and the harmonic two. So that's fourth dimension, fifth dimension, and sixth dimensional Pleiadians. The ur terranites formed an agreement with several other races called the Covenant of Palador. So I'm not going to go really into this again. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll find the episode where we did the whole um, talk on the Covenant of Palador. But Palador is a race line of beings. Um, it is an agreement that has been created by multiple race lines to really uphold the Christos mission which is again, allowing us all a way to incarnate and to return back home out of these denser incarnational cycles and realities. So the mission involved the creation of the sphere of Amenti to allow open transit between earth and Tara. So Tara again within the Pleiades for beings possessing genetic codes that can endure portal transit. So this again is just another way of saying that this is what initiations were for. This is what it means to become, uh, clean up our spiritual hygiene, activate our heart to the unity consciousness codes of love and those vibrations that allow us to activate our body's genetics in order to pass through these spheres, in order to actually break out of the incarnational or reincarnational cycle within these lower dimensional spectrums of the, the dimensions of one, two, and three. We wanna get to where we can incarnate back up into four, five, and six, and so on and so forth. So those involved in this agreement again were the Syrians, the Pleiadians, the ur terranites the Elohims, the Lyrans, the Ceres, and um, the Alanians, the Luminans and the Alanians. And these all together work together and are what we call the Paladorian. So when we call the covenant of Palador, we are talking about these Christ consciousness race lines of beings that have unified together, 
who together help to create the sphere of Amenti on that timeline in order for us to have this ability to get back out of these lower frequencies and to restore the genetics within this, this, uh, this time matrix in order for all sentient race lines and beings to activate themselves again, to have all of the genetic codes within themselves again, that we plug all of our quote unquote ju junk DNA back into working functioning DNA again. So now, just as I go through this, as we start to talk about these incarnational cycles that these Maharaji blue flame beings take, what, we are going to have an example to look at Akhenaten. Akhenaten is a beautiful example of one of these Christ consciousness beings that came into an incarnational cycle. And when we see his path, it's so familiar as we even were to look at, say, Yeshua or many of the other ascended beings who have come to earth in order to help share and remind humanity to light the consciousness, to light the light in the minds of others about remembering that we are special, that you hold God right inside of you. You don't need a temple. You don't need others. But I want to just highlight some of the amazing things within his lifetime that when he came into incarnation, he was actually quite drawn to the higher spiritual teachings. He went through the initiations. Back then, it was the initiations of Isis. And these would have been the initiations of the activation of the second, or sorry, the seven chakras in order to awaken all of your energy centers so that you move the divine Keros Gamos union of energy throughout you so that you have the control and the ability to move through your intentions, purely harmonized and activated light codes within you. That as we awaken these centers within us, that this is the initiation, we become the living lamp, we become the living light, we become our own Merkaba, right? This is the Merkaba teachings, creating our light vehicle, being the light being. And we'll go in probably in either probably even next week and into more of the ISIS, really kind of talking a little bit more of these sacred initiations of the ISIS or even the Magdalene, uh, the sacred teachings. But he dreamed of a world where individuals lived in peace, harmony, and were equal to each other under the law. So during his time when he was when he was young, his father was an incredible ruler. His father had taken the kingdom of Egypt to its massive heights at that point in time. The kingdom of which his father ruled, I think they called it the upper and lower of Egypt. And it was just a massive, expansive, um, a dominating force upon the earth. At that time, it was a time when there was many demigods, many deities. They prayed to many idols, to many different gods. They worshiped many different beings upon the earth. This is a time when the priests were getting quite hungry for the power that they were given in their stations of power within Egypt. Within Egypt, there was the Pharaoh, there was the ruler, and then the royal family. But the next really that held great stations of power were these priests. And they made lots of money off of selling many of these things to the common population. So within this, it was very much hierarchical. Who had more power? Who had stations of identity? Um, the ownership of land, the ownership of who had and who didn't, right? And the power that had been accumulated within Egypt and the wealth that had been accumulated had been accumulated through a very powerful um, uh, reign of, of dynasties that had been great warriors through war, through overtaking other countries. So when Akhenaten... Uh, was under the rulership of his father, his father was starting to kind of bring him in to groom him. And he actually became, because his father passed away, he actually became the ruler of Egypt at a very young age. He was only, I think, 19 years old when he took rulership. And within this, 
he again had been very, very attuned to more of the spiritual teachings. He again was a Syrian starseed who birthed in and there was no accident to the position I feel that he had in that incarnation, the ability that he had to wield some of the ways in which he was going to teach some of the things he taught. But he took over a kingdom that was used to domination. They were used to power. They were used to just conquering other nations. They were used to a very male dominated uh, world. And within years, he very quickly put a stop to all of that. And he started to really initiate out there that we are here to serve each other. He was incredibly devoted to spiritual life. He was all about living in harmony and balance and in balance with the natural world, with nature. And this is what the teachings and the schools were that he created were all about. He was all about teaching the integrity of the thoughts, how important your thoughts were, how important it was to have integrity with your thoughts. Do not think thoughts <laughs> that you do not want to happen. Be mindful of what you are intending because there is power in the mind. So he started to teach people not only about the power of the mind, but his main teachings within there was that our ability to use our mind and to create images and use your imagination was the greatest representation of your ability to be connected to the divine and to the all. Because in essence, because you could think, because you could create through imagination and create images within your mind, that truly this was the expression of source. And that is how you were a part of source. That was how you were connected to source. His teachings were based on unity. I'm going to move this over here. And that at the base of all of his teachings, that the light was what existed in us, be it a rock, be it a tree, be it whatever it was that he taught about the atom. He taught about the atom, the rays of love and light. And that love light is the animating light of our creator. So as you even start to hear all of this, you can start to feel the resonance and the vibration with the Christ consciousness teachings. He came in at a time when I really want to amplify. <laughs> it's very similar to what we've been dealing with here on earth all over again. History repeating itself. He came at a time when the, the, the rulership, the priests, the temples were really very corrupt. They had nothing to do with sacred teachings. They had nothing to do with, with honoring the ancient, true Atlantean teachings. They had nothing to do with giving power back to the people. They were really all about being a dominating force and power that was creating revenue off of the people through getting them to buy idols, getting them to buy blessings, getting them to like donate their monies to these temples and to these um, to these priest lineage lines. And this is a time I want to say just because, you know, I have even some memories of remote viewing back in these times. This is a time when if you, the priests were really adept at even the dark magics at this time. This is stuff that they had learned from far, far back um, in the wisdoms and the teachings. And so when the priests battled, they would battle with conjuring. They would battle with spells. They would battle with dark magic. This was not a time when they played nice. And at this point in time, if they were utilizing that level of magic, this is the ability to conjure up dust storms or even plagues or different things like this. This is really kind of the elemental magics on the planet. And here he came in at a time where he's very young. He's like 19 years old, maybe up into 22 years old. And he says, I'm going to change this entire kingdom. And he pretty much changed it overnight. He was all about monotheism, one God. And he utilized the sun as an example of God because, again, of the rays that it emanated out towards all humanity that the rays of light represented the light that we absorb within us that lives within us and that we are and therefore 
when we animate this love within us, that we then all have access to the creator that we don't need other deities. We don't need to worship idols. We don't need to pray to all of these gods. God is right inside of you. And it is through this love light. It's through this wisdom animating light right inside of you. So I really saw this as an example of his Essenes model. He immediately started disbanding all the temples, taking down all the other deities. So basically pissing off all the priests, <laughs> because he basically took their power away from them overnight. And remember, they were one of the most powerful people in the kingdom. And you go out and you wipe out somebody's power, they get pretty pissed very, very quickly. So within this, as he started to do this, he actually started returning the land to the people. It was very similar to the Essenes, where it was as, if, as though everything became community. There should be no hierarchy. There should be no poor or rich or middle class that we are that we are. If we live here, then we all deserve. Everyone should have equal status, equal right, equal um, acknowledgement. Whether or not you were the one baking bread or you were the one helping to build something, it didn't matter that all should have equal honor within the community. And here's, now I'm going to give you the deeper reason, and I'm actually going to show a slide, um, and this is actually a slide right from Energetic Synthesis, um, that Akhenaten really, truly, as a, a Syrian starseed, what he came to do was to overturn the power source that these negative priest lineage lines were cultivating. So let me tell you why they were having so much power. The negative Anu family line. So the negative Anunnaki that had come upon the earth and some of the outside invading forces that had come to earth and wanted to overpower it and take it as their own. The, the way that they did this was all the way back, and this, this timeline goes so far back, but we're going to just go to the last fall of Atlantis. What they did is they actually embedded themselves within the royal families and within the priest lines, and they mimicked the ancient wisdom teachings of the Syrians, but then they, they started to twist and turn them. We see that that's just super common. I know I can say that, and you guys go like, oh yeah, that's happening today. But as I share this with you, that I want to share one more factor. These off-planetary beings that were coming to take over the earth, that they were utilizing the earth as, as their territory, their resources. So therefore, you know, they really saw the population of all of these races. There were many different seed races from other extraterrestrial race lines. But they started to see them all as kind of their property and their ability to kind of use them for their own resources. And one of the ways they do that is they don't do it outright. They do it by manipulating the mind. And one of the best manipulations of the mind has always been through religion or sacred doctrinations or teachings. And so within this, these off-planetary beings could not withstand this this environment on earth because it didn't match their star they weren't born on earth so therefore the electromagnetic frequencies on this planet the gravitational forces just the energetic frequencies from our sun didn't match what their body needed because they were from another territory they were from another star system so therefore their bodies started to deteriorate and actually go through the aging process while they were here on earth. In order to create longevity of life, they had to utilize their tinctures, their, their um, crystalline technologies, their gifts and capabilities of their higher scientific knowledge in order to keep their body regenerating. This, if you've read any of Anton Park's books, um, is one example that will tell you how blood was a very important elixir to perpetuate this elixir of life for this off-planetary race of beings. 
Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of graphic details, um, but the reason why that the priests started to create ritualistic practices that the people should offer their child to the church for sacrifice was for the sacred fluids within the child. The sacred fluids that were utilized for these elixirs of life came from the pineal gland and it came from the adrenals. And so therefore, I, again, I'm not going to go into the, de the details, but these are just, you know, even here, I'm just going to read it even from her, um, the way she put it. Um, but it was, um, he, Akhenaten came to unleash, uh, to really kind of clean up these demonic remnants upon the earth, to clean up the mess, the dark forces that were here, these lower astral beings that were on this earth, these other beings that were utilizing the population of earth, basically at their whim. But the, the thing that I want to say is it's not as if they were just killing beings. That it's like, we have to understand it wasn't just the death of a, a being or a child that was taking place. But we have to realize that each time one of these sacrifices happened, it was ritualistic and it was binding energy to the lower astral realms and therefore empowering the lower astral realms. We need to realize when we talk about this idea of balancing the darkness of the light, that on a balanced spectrum of the universe, had there been no manipulation, the darkness would not be demonic. <laughs> it would just be darkness, right? But when you utilize reversal energy, dark magic, rituals, and spells, it's about embedding the darkness with evil, with malice, with hatred, with these lower emotional vibrations that now create demonics and entities that are bound to the blood of the beings on the planet. And that is how many times we deal with things through our bloodline when we're clearing bloodline curses, bloodline binding, bloodline spells, and things that have traveled with us for lifetime after lifetime. It's hard for us to think of these things as taking place for millennia of time. Now, I'm not going to go that much more into that, but I just want to tie that bit in there. Akhenaten came primarily to stop these dark demonic rituals that the priests were enacting. Now, it wasn't just that the priests lost their power. The reason, again, they had power is because these off-planetary beings gave them power for them to accumulate the energy of the elixirs that they needed, right? They were like the in-between for controlling the population and giving them the resources they needed for longevity of life. So these priests were like these go-in-betweens that were totally willing to sacrifice their own people for a state of power. We see this over and over and over and over and over again through every history line. Humanity, humans are wired to turn on themselves for, for safety, for security, for power, for wealth. I don't know why we're wired that way. It's something. But there is an energy within that when one holds the Christ consciousness path, that there is no amount of bribery that would ever allow that to happen, right? It's like I could say without a doubt, each of us here within this group, we could sit here and listen to this and go like, yeah, no, not going to happen. I'm not going to be agreeing with that or allowing them to do that to our population, to our beings, to our people, to the spark of divine light on this planet. And so when these priests started to lose their power, they were in the in-between of also getting hit from the off-planetary beings of now they aren't fulfilling their bargain, right? And they're also not receiving the power from the people anymore. And they're becoming equals because Akhenaten was about everyone being equal. So within his time, he really came to change the timeline to bring back the law of one ascension technology back to the planet. He really worked with the Sphinx, um, the connection to the inner earth, arc technology. He was here to really stop the child sacrifice that was happening and the blood sacrifice that was happening upon the planet. He was really helping to initiate portals 
um, and really activating the Melchizedek initiations and setting the groundwork for the Essenes. This is really kind of the timeline where the beginning of the Essenes would have been formulated and been put into motion. Um, he was really here to embed Christ consciousness in every way, shape, and form. And so when we look at this, that I just want to say that within this, that as he started to implement these teachings, I, I'm not going to go into these other slides I have. Um, when he started to implement these teachings, his reign did not last for very long. Uh, I don't, gosh, I don't have it right in my head. I think, I think he only ruled for 17 years because of what he was doing to promote the change. He was willing to come in as a youth. Now, I want to just say this outright again for you guys one more time. Just imagine he was 19 years old. Where were we when we were 19? <laughs> were we willing to stand up to an entire entourage of pharaohs, of, of priests, of an entire nation to literally uproot thousands of years of practices within a nation. He literally changed something that was over 15,000 years old and ingrained into a nation and said, no, we're going to go back to unity law of one consciousness. This unity law of one was all about the primary teachings of the consciousness uh, gestalt. So this is about us. When we can think of law of one teachings, this is about us reinstating higher levels of consciousness so that when we do connect with the serious star nation, the Centaurians, the Lyrans, the Andromedans, the Pleiadians, this is the base teachings. This is the base understandings that we come from. And we're not quite there yet because even within our society, it's still a level of, well, that's mine and that's yours. <laughs> there is no concept of communal land. There is no concept of really the level of sharing that he came in to implement. He literally started giving the land back to the people disbanding levels of hierarchy within the nation, implementing this monotheism of the living light lives right inside of you. And that as a young man, that he was so willing to uphold this mission that his lifetime on this earth ended very quickly because he was murdered. But it was also something when you really check into it, that he laid such a such an important foundation for Yeshua to even come in, for the Essenes, for the Druids, for all of these different lineage lines that have held the sacred ancient wisdom teachings. And as we get to explore these again, that I am saying all of these to you as an invitation for you to step back into remembering what were our ancient wisdom teachings? What really truly was living by the law of one? What truly was living so unconditional that we did not see hierarchy, we don't see color, we don't see status, we don't see race, we don't see difference. Now, the one last thing I will say that I just wanted to point out even from this picture here is I want you to notice his body. He changed the way art was shown within Egypt because he wanted people to actually notice his elongated skull, the different stature of his body, to really allow, without a doubt, when you see this being as an understanding of off-planetary influence in our serious star nation influence on this planet, you don't have a doubt in your mind, this is extraterrestrial genetics. He wanted us to know he was not from this earth, but he came to remind us of where we are from. And as we hold this knowing that we are holding many of us fragments of this bloodline, 
and we are holding within us, I would say all of us, the energy of the mission that he was holding. And so as we get to honor this timeline that I invite each and every one of you to go within your hearts, that any places, that any of the massacres, any of the, of the death that took place, any of the defamation, because the last thing I will say about his lifetime is that after he died, the ruler that came after him was so dark. This being, this is when you hear about that history time in Egypt where the ruler went and spent years commissioning and putting people out across the entire nation to chisel away any memory of Akhenaten from any of the buildings, any of the statues. There is very, very little left to, rem to remind us of his time because what he came to teach was so detrimental to the dark forces and the controller forces on this planet that they wanted to erase him from our history. And it's our job in our living DNA and our cellular memories to reawaken our living library again of the memories of our beautiful ancestors who have come to uphold exactly who we are here to be in this lifetime. So let your life be a living example for all of the efforts that this amazing, incredible star being came to share with this earth that I am going to post within just because I don't, I've sh shared quite a bit, but I will be sharing with this, within this post, a couple other links, um, especially some links with the uh, energetic synthesis site on Akhenaten uh, and uh, the Maharaji Syrian Blu-ray lineage line, just so you can read about it a little bit more. That for those of you that hold memories of ancient Egyptian times of upholding the sacred wisdoms. And there is a lot of speculation that Akhenaten is tied in with Moses somehow. I leave that to you guys to play with. I, I really, I just know my energy with him as a Styrian starseed. That as you connect with him through the, through the path of your heart, that this is going to be about awakening the initiations within us. So I'm going to invite you, and this is stuff we're going to do within the workshop, is doing these remembrances of these initiation practices of awakening our chakra centers again. What were these ancient initiations, our Syrian initiations that really taught us how to awaken our body to be our Merkaba vehicle so that we could activate our crystalline DNA and our codes. This is our sacred geometry, our breath work, the colors, the fire letters, all of that. Um, I do want to share one last thing because I just want to invite, I did post on the telegram a little bit about a series. Um, this individual, I think his name is Daniel Sala. I'm just saying it off of the top of my head. He's, he must be one of those beings that has like um, picture memory because he basically, I know he's not reading anything and he's re-encounting the entire series of the Transylvania series from Radu Cinemar. And I will tell you, these books are long. There's eight of them. And I, it, it's one of those things that I have a hard time reading the books because I do better with audio just time-wise and because of my eyesight. And so I haven't had the chance to read all of them. And so it's a gift. If you want an opportunity to actually have an experience of what these books are about, I feel they are so important for us to ingest. I feel as though they are bringing back history, memories. These books are all about... Um, uh, stations that are being discovered within sacred places on the earth, within these mountains, within these places that are connected to inner earth beings. These are scientific stations that belong to the Syrians. 
So they are biology stations. They have the most incredible technologies within them, but within these books, I will tell you, I love the summary that this guy does because a lot of the books are just, they count by count. The guy that wrote it is almost like, it's like a journal. And then we did this and then we did that. And so this guy gives you the nuggets of it. And this last book within here, this is actually book six. And again, I think there's eight books or there's seven and an eighth is coming out. But it spells out exactly how fire letters or the letters determine what family line you come from. And I just wanted to show this picture because I thought it gave a great example. So this is from the book um, Forgotten Genesis. And this is talking about the T. But I want you to see, oh, it won't let me highlight it. The T in here, and it's symbolizing the shape of the T and that the T really corresponds to the, or, the orbiting elements that every star nation that you're on. So if you're in the Sirius star system, your atoms would have to vibrate and oscillate within the frequencies of that star. So your genetic patterns and your fire letters will match that, your DNA will match that, and therefore it will orbit different inside of your body than it would if you were born on Earth or on Centaurus or in Lyra. And so as we get a chance to look at this, it's just a gift and a capability for us to have a visualization of what we really mean by how of our light code moves, how the mathematics, the geometry within us moves, that our orbiting um, orbital arrangement is really according to the influence of whatever symbols are within our DNA. And I also think there's a, a for those of you that have potentially read, and I think one of you actually posted within the telegram, the book, the I think it's called The Wisdom Code by Greg Braden. But he goes into this whole thing about how when they've been able to look at the genetic codes within there, they found the sequence of the letters uh, Yahweh within there. So it, that's what we say when God is written right within our codes. It's a stamp and a signature. When you know how to read the DNA, you know exactly who you belong to. <laughs> So I just think that's really cool. And in a lot of ways that as we do that humming, that toning, that we can we can rewrite our language right inside of us, like almost like the, oh, I'm going to say this wrong. I want to say amigrams or those things where you take letters and you rearrange them and you make a new word and you can arrange it in just the right way. So that is what it really means in a lot of ways for us to reinstate our original blueprint. So Thank you guys for sticking with me through that whole thing. I know it was a lot. <laughs>